Michael Beth, um, uh, welcome again to the uh, Yale Bible Study, and we're going to be talking about the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, I know you've done a lot of work on that, and uh, it's a really interesting and important gospel in the history of Christianity, isn't it? Can you say something about um, how, it, uh, how it compares with the other uh, gospels that we have and what's distinctive about it? Yeah. The Gospel of Matthew um, is especially Jewish. So we have several different features of the gospel that point to this fact. Matthew quotes the Old Testament the most out of all of the canonical gospels. Matthew also does not explain Jewish custom in the same way that, for example, the Gospel of Mark does. So that implies that he assumes his audience will understand Jewish tradition and custom. Even the structure of Matthew reflects Jewish influence. Um, we have these five discourses of Jesus that Matthew has organized his story around. And several people have suggested that this is actually in order to reflect the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. So perhaps Matthew is portraying Jesus subtly, even through the structure of the gospel, as a new Moses, giving a new law to his people. Um, so those are some of the unique features about Matthew. So uh, Jewish uh, or Jewish Christian audience is somewhere in the background. Uh, do we know anything about the, the date and uh, immediate situation of the gospel? Yeah, so we think that Matthew was written in probably the 80s CE, um, so after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans, which happened in 70. We have several places in Matthew that have overtones of that destruction, um, so it suggests that Matthew is in a sense reflecting on what happened in that event. We think that it was written in Antioch possibly, but probably in Syria. And again, to J Jewish Christians, so people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah already, but are struggling with the aftermath of the destruction of the temple and what it means to not only be Jewish, but to be Jewish followers of Jesus in that time period. Mm -hmm. Interesting, though, that eventually it catches on as a uh, gospel that uh, appeals to Gentiles, too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and that's one of the tensions we're going to be exploring. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Okay, so we're going to get, uh, get started by thinking a little bit about um, uh, the first uh, chapters of, of Matthew, the first um, chapters that deal with the birth and, um, uh, of Jesus and the, uh, the aftermath. Can you say something about the, those chapters and what's uh, distinctive about them? Absolutely. So Matthew starts with this genealogy, and um, I remember growing up always just skipping this part. Uh, I think... Who begot whom is a little exactly, bit Exactly, the yeah. boring begots. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think for Matthew it's incredibly important to start the story this way because he's framing what he's about to say about Jesus. He's setting Jesus up as the Jewish Messiah. And the other gospel we have that starts with the genealogy is Luke's gospel. Luke traces Jesus' genealogy back to Adam, to the first human. Matthew, in contrast, traces Je Jesus' genealogy back through the Jewish line, through King David, to Abraham. The, the promise of the blessing of the people of Israel. So I think for, for Matthew, this genealogy is important to set Jesus up as the Jewish Messiah. Um, and we know that it's not a biological lineage that Matthew cares about. It has a very clear structure. We have these three sets of 14 uh, generations that don't really make sense in terms of timing. Um, what matters for Matthew is more uh, setting Jesus in the framework of Jewish history. Mm -hmm. Are there any women in the genealogy? There are. What are they doing there? There are, and these are very interesting women. So um, they're not just, uh, they're not Jewish women, um, for one thing. So we have these four women who are um, Gentiles for, um, to start with, but they're also women who are in some way associated with scandalous stories. So we have a Tamar who posed as a prostitute and slept with her father-in-law, and we have uh, Ruth, we have Rahab, we have, it says the wife of Uzziah, which we know is Bathsheba, um, 
with whom David committed adultery. So there's some scandal in um, these women's stories as well. And, and there's been some debate about which is more important for Matthew, whether the fact that they're Gentiles and from the beginning Gentiles are a part of the story, um, or whether it's the scandal that they're setting up the reader for the scandal of Jesus's birth. And we know that Jesus's birth was a scandal. And why was that scandalous? It was a scandal because it was a virgin birth. Mm -hmm. So um, it, we have this note in Matthew where he says that Joseph, um, being a righteous man, chose to divorce Mary quietly uh, before he received a dream and was told not to do that. Um, but that indicates that there was scandal behind this story, that she was pregnant aside from her husband. So. Mm -hmm. so there's a bit of apology going on and mm -hmm. at the same time maybe an interesting theological move about incorporating Gentiles right from the get-go. Right. Hmm? Uh, we encounter some other Gentiles in, um, in Matthew's birth story too, don't mm -hmm. we? These uh, magi who come right. in following a star. Who, who are magi and what are they anyhow? Well to go way back they are uh, Zoroastrian priests um, so they have this connection with magic in the ancient world but a major part of that is interpretation of the stars so they're astrologers which of course makes sense because what they're doing in Matthew's story is they're following a star. Um, I think for Matthew what really matters about them is that they are Gentiles as you said that they are incorporated into this story even from the beginning, that they have come to worship the Jewish Messiah from outside of the people of Israel. And is, is Matthew, uh, what, endorsing astrology by having these magi from Persia come in and follow a star? I don't think so. I think Matthew's um, suggesting that there's something really important about the birth of Jesus and that even these Gentiles who follow the signs of the stars um, who are involved in magic in some way um, in the ancient worldview, even they recognize that something special has happened in the birth of Jesus. Uh, I want to go back for a minute to the, um, the business of the virgin birth uh, and um, Matthew has his narrative about that. Uh, but he also gives us a quotation from the Old Testament that uh, somehow supports it or gives uh, evidence of it. Uh, where, where is that coming from and what's Matthew up to with that? Yeah, I think this is something we find throughout the whole Gospel of Matthew, that he, is, he takes pains to connect Jesus and the event of Jesus coming to Hebrew Bible or Old Testament prophecy. So we have this prophecy in the Old Testament that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, for example. And he cites that. He, he says this is to fulfill the prophecy. He cites the prophecy that the Messiah will come of a virgin, will be born of a virgin. So he makes very explicit that Jesus is the one that they have been waiting for and that the prophets have written about for years and years. Is, is this way of reading the Old Testament common in this period or is Matthew doing something new and innovative? I think Matthew is doing something new in the sense that he is directing his audience to understand the scriptures with respect to a very specific person, and that's Jesus. So to understand the Old Testament prophecies as pointing to the Messiah, of course, is not new, but the way that Matthew pulls it together and points to the person of Jesus is unique, and I think it's part of why um, people reacted negatively mm -hmm. to Jews, especially reacted to this message that it was Jesus, this Galilean who, mm -hmm. you know, is being claimed to be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. I remember reading something uh, about uh, some Qumran texts that uh, do something similar, but there's, there's not this, this focus on uh, a particular individual like Jesus. Is, would that be fair? Or? Are you thinking of the... Uh, Pesher Habakkuk, for instance, teacher of righteousness and right. all that stuff. Yeah. Right, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think we can talk more about this later as well, but mm -hmm. I think that Matthew is um, certainly tapping into this tradition of a, a wisdom teacher, teacher of righteousness, who is re the, the hidden mysteries of God are revealed to this person. And, mm -hmm. and then this person reveals those mysteries to the people of God. So... I think that 
for Matthew, Jesus is the embodiment of that wisdom figure. So a little bit like what we get in the Gospel of John, right, with uh, the Logos, which yeah. is kind of equivalent yeah. to wisdom. And that'll come up where, I think it's in chapter 11, where um, we hear about wisdom. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there's something else going on with mm -hmm. uh, all of this uh, focus on uh, fulfillment of, uh, of Scripture. Mm -hmm. right? um, it, the, the ministry of Jesus um, uh, begins after his birth with John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Um, what's going on in that uh, episode? It, it's sort of a strange description, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's wearing camel hairs and eating locusts and honey. And I think if you uh, weren't familiar with the Old Testament, that would seem sort of strange. But for those who were, and Matthew's audience probably was, this is a picture of the prophet Elijah. So it, the description is very similar. Um, he has a similar kind of belt. Um, and he has a similar mission. He, he is uh, sent to proclaim and prepare the way of the Lord. So I think that Matthew is painting John the Baptist in that tradition of the prophet Elijah. And, and then he really portrays John as preparing the way for Jesus in several different ways. So uh, for example, John the Baptist in Matthew proclaims the message that ultimately ends up being Jesus's message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He proclaims that message first in Matthew. He also faces opposition, the Sadducees and Pharisees, that eventually would become Jesus's main opposition. And then he also prepares the way by proclaiming judgment. And this is a theme we'll see all throughout the Gospel of Matthew, that judgment is coming and Jesus is that judge. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, John the Baptist then is a kind of hinge picking up on mm -hmm. uh, a fulfillment notion and Elijah, the identification of John with Elijah is going to be uh, part of the narrative later on. Right. The judgment motif, yeah, that mm -hmm. certainly seems very, uh, very important. There's a bit of dialogue between Jesus and John mm -hmm. about uh, Jesus getting baptized. What's going on with right, that? Right, right. There's that disagreement of mm -hmm. who should baptize whom. Um, and that's not in Mark, which uh, we think Matthew used Mark. So why would he add that in there? I think it may reflect some embarrassment in the early Christian community over Jesus' baptism because, of course, John the Baptist is proclaiming a baptism of repentance. So if Jesus needs to be baptized by John, is that implying that Jesus needs to repent, that Jesus is sinful. And so I think by adding this um, disagreement in, Matthew is sort of subtly addressing that and saying, this baptism is not about Jesus being sinful and needing to repent, it's rather about enacting the kingdom of heaven. And that is what Jesus says, right? He says that we need to do this to fulfill God's plan. And I think that's also important that Jesus draws John the Baptist into enacting that plan as well. That's, I think, a theme we'll see again in the gospel as well, Jesus drawing others into the enactment or the inbreaking of the kingdom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's interesting that there seems to be another uh, apologetic strain going on here, right? Mm -hmm. Just as Matthew has to explain and uh, contextualize these claims about Jesus being born of a virgin mm -hmm. and show that that has precedent and um, prophetic witness. And so for John the Baptist, he has to be kind of marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. his relationship with Jesus explained in some way, but in a way that also uh, provides continuity for what's going on in the, uh, the story as a whole. Okay. Right. Um, in the baptism scene, uh, Jesus has a, a, a voice, or the story talks about a voice coming onto mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, the stage and proclaiming Jesus uh, God's son. Uh, what do you make of that episode? Is, is this a point where Jesus becomes God's son or mm. what? Mm. I know there were some who argued that in Christian history. Mm. I think um, I don't see that uh, behind Matthew's depiction. I think it's interesting that in Matthew, the voice speaks in the third person. So he says, this is my son. Mm -hmm. And in Mark and in Luke, the voice speaks in the second person. He says, you are my son. So I think for Matthew, that subtle little shift is a way of saying, this is a public announcement for other people that this is my son, and you audience should view him that way. 
Right, so you could read the Markan story in particular as a um, uh, kind of uh, account of the, the moment when Jesus becomes aware of who he is, right. uh, or a vocational moment or something. Right. Uh, whereas in, in Matthew, it seems to be a, a public recognition of a, a state that's already there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, and again, maybe a little bit of apology going on against a, a kind of uh, view of Christ that sees him as a mere human being who right. um, became uh, a prophet in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, would you, how would you want to summarize these first couple of uh, chapters of, of Matthew? What, what are the main things that they are trying to get across? I think, well, we've pointed out several sort of apologetic strands. I think for Matthew, really the most important part about setting up his story is this connection with Jesus being the Jewish Messiah who has been expected. He is the one who Israel has been waiting for for such a long time. And I think the way Matthew starts his story is geared directly toward painting that picture. Mm -hmm. And so next time we'll be exploring a little bit about what this Messiah teaches. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.